frankly, Senator Coburn covered a lot of what I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, the death master list. I, I, I do want to find out about the costs for this. Why are we charging for this? It, I mean, this is going to save us money that shouldn't be paid out. Um, why, why are we charging between government agencies for this list? Sure. Under the law, we're required to be reimbursed for this activity, um, unless there's like a quid pro quo activity where we're also benefiting from data from another agency where we can do an exchange. But generally speaking, we're required to be reimbursed. Well, that, that we need to look at that, Mr. Chairman. Um, and is the, the complete list more expensive than the not complete list? Yes, it's based on, the, the cost is based on the quantity of data that we're supplying, and so if we're including state data, then it's more records and it would cost more. And why are some agencies being charged more than others? Like why is the Department of Defense, um, the Defense Manpower Data Center paying 40,000 annually and you only pay 10,000 to, CMS only pays 10,000? That would depend on what we're getting back from CMS. So if we're getting data from CMS to use in the administration of our benefit programs that we would otherwise be paying for, there would be a quid pro quo arrangement so we would charge them less money. D does anybody see that this is a problem? M let me go down. Do, do any of you here think that should be fixed? Um, I, I can OMB? take... Well, I, I certainly want us to have a, an effective and coherent process for the way in which agencies are reimbursing one another for services provided. I just don't know the details enough in this particular situation to understand why there's, those differences are occurring, so I wouldn't want to comment on it. But I agree with the general principle. We should have a, a logical approach for the manner in which that we are reimbursing one another. Um, well, and I could activities. see it if this was a list that was going to somehow enhance the ability of someone else to provide a service, but what this list is for is to keep money from going out the door that shouldn't be going out the door. I mean, I, it seems like to me we should be falling all over ourselves, no matter what part of government we are, to make sure this list is everywhere, complete, and no one is having to figure out whether or not it's really worth it for them to budget for it. Because frankly, if this was their money, if these were private businesses, if you all were under one big private business and you were different divisions of a big business, uh, do you really think this kind of artificial barriers would be put up if it all came down to the bottom line? Well, this is the bottom line for taxpayers. So I, I would really like all of you to um, formally respond to whether or not you think it's a great idea that this should be a matter of if you want the good list, it's going to cost you more money in order to prevent paying out money that the government shouldn't be paying. Um, I, I, I would like that from you. Let me also ask you, um, uh, Mr. Werfel, about um, Department of Defense. According to their own statistical sampling, they acknowledge they are underestimating their improper payments. They say, yeah, we're underestimating. But every year, you sign off on those estimates. Aren't you sending the wrong signal when you're signing off on e estimates that are being acknowledged by the agency are incorrect and, uh, and underestimating the amount that is really going out the door in improper payments? Uh, I'm glad you raised the question, Senator. Two, two or three reactions on DOD. First, they, they have had challenges with their error measurement. Their 2011 error measurement, GAO wrote a report with a very long set of recommendations for how to improve it. DOD concurred with each and has since uh, updated their error measurement. Now, GAO has not gone back yet and reevaluated, but their IG did an evaluation, and so far um, we didn't see anything coming to that IG report that seemed to indicate that the DOD had repeated some of those problems. But to your question, OMB did not sign off on DOD's error measurement. In fact, when I cite in my testimony 4.35% error rate. I do not include the DOD error measurement in that number. And the reason is, is because if I were to do it, then the error rate would actually be 3.7% government-wide. It would, it, would, it would precipitously drop because DOD's reporting such a small amount of error on such a large denominator and we scratched our heads when we saw that and we said, we're not yet comfortable impacting our government-wide number in such a significant way until we get more assurance from GAO, DOD, DODIG that that number is robust. 
So we are, we, we, I think DOD is doing the right thing by measuring and trying to perfect that measurement and responding to GAO recommendations. But I agree, until we have a greater degree of confidence, we're not going to be placing that number in our government-wide numbers. Well, you may not be placing the number in your government-wide numbers, but DOD is claiming that they are um, compliant with the improper payment law because you sign off on their estimate every year. And that's my question. If they are pegging their compliance with the fact that you're signing off and you are signing off on estimates that everyone acknowledges is too low, doesn't that send the wrong message government-wide? It, it would. I don't, I, I, I have to be honest, I don't know uh, the, or understand the, the concept of OMB signing off on an error rate in order to generate compliance. We, we, they put the error rate as required in their uh, annual financial statement report. Um, the Inspector General will look at that report. The Inspector General, under the law, is required to do the compliance review. Um, our, from OMB's position, we want agencies to continually generate better error measurements, but there's no point in time that I'm aware of where, where me or anyone in my office is saying, stamp of approval, this is good. We rely on the Inspector General to, uh, to do that for us. Mr. Carroll, did you want to... Uh, Senator, Carol? I think you would um, mentioned before is, is that the Inspector General has, you know, marked them as compliant when we do our IPERA wrap-up reports. They are one of the ones that are listed as compliant by it. So the Inspector General has, you know, taken the statement by the agency, reviewed it, and said they're within compliance. But I think on that one, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go back, check with Department of Defense and IG and find out why they are saying it's compliant and why they are using that percentage from yeah. it, it uh, kind DOD. Of, it kind of um, sullies the exercise it does. when an agency is saying, we know we're not doing it right, but by the way, we're compliant. So that kind of seems common sense-wise to defeat the purpose. Let me finally talk, get back to the death master file. Um, I know that the uh, bar at this point, and you said in terms of sharing it, is for agencies that are paying benefits. Um, but, but Treasury is really working at a do not pay effort. And are you saying that the law currently does not allow you to share with Treasury, even though they are working on a comprehensive do not pay initiative that's going to save taxpayers a lot of money, that you um, are prohibited in the law from sharing this list with them? Yes, we are. Section 205R of the Social Security Act strictly prohibits disclosure for that purpose. Now, we support that purpose, don't get me wrong, and that's why we have a proposal in the President's FY14 budget to expand our authority to be able to disclose information more broadly to federal agencies, not only for purposes of do not pay, but also for law enforcement, health and safety, and other related issues that we cannot currently disclose for. Okay. Well, um, I, I know that uh, Senator Coburn is on this, and, and I know the chairman's on this in terms of giving you the language you need. Um, I'll continue to follow up to see if we can't make this important, vital information available without people worrying about um, whether they have to choose between furloughing an employee or buying the death master list. I don't think that is a good choice in today's federal government. And um, to me, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know which one they'd choose, and I'm not sure that's the one that's in the best interest of the taxpayer, although I certainly feel for the federal employees. Might I just offer one thought on this, just to provide a little bit of context about the basis for the, the requirement that we get reimbursed. It's not, it's not unique to this issue. Anytime Social Security does work for another agency that's not very specific to the administration of our programs, we are prohibited from using trust fund money to do that. So that's the basis in law, not that that couldn't be modified, but again, we would be, if we did not charge, using Social Security trust fund money to do work for other agencies. Well, I, I, I understand where, where the law comes from, but sometimes the application of the law um, doesn't make sense if you put on your big common sense hat. And I think this is one place that it doesn't make sense. I think most people that are receiving Social Security would like the idea that we'd bring down the improper payments money so that they're sure Social Security is going to be stable uh, into the future. I don't think most of the people that are benefiting from this program would have a problem with us making the death information um, universally available across government in order to avoid paying out benefits to people who have, um, who have passed on. So.